On the night of November 1, 1999, Kevin Brain, a 31-year-old police officer, dropped his two sons off at his estranged wife's house in Dayton, Ohio. As Kevin walked back to his car, an assailant stepped out of the bushes and shot him in the back of the neck with a shotgun. It's been 24 years since Officer Kevin Brain was killed, and investigators are still searching for the person responsible. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a licensed private investigator and former police detective. And each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve a case. And, and if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever platform you use. All right, so before we get into the case, a couple house cleaning things real quick. So first off, you might notice if you're a Crime Weekly fan, I got the uh, fresh out of the shower after the gym hair tonight. I do apologize. I try to keep it a little bit more official with Detective Perspective, but it is currently 12.45 a.m., And the reason that I'm recording this, I can now finally say it, by the time you're seeing this episode, um, my first episode of my new show, Crime Feed, uh, will be premiering on Discovery ID. It actually will have already came out by this point. Uh, It's going to be with myself, Nancy Grace, and Mara Campo. You might have seen the special that the three of us did for the Gilgo Beach murders. That was a pilot to kind of see what our chemistry was. And now we have been picked up for series And we will be coming out with a new episode, I believe, every single Wednesday. So after I get done recording this, I'm going to, it's a Saturday night. I know I'm really, uh, I'm out there partying. I'm going to go back to my house. I'm going to pack up a little bit. I leave tomorrow for New York City, which will obviously Sunday afternoon. And uh, we'll be recording the first episode on Monday. But again, this is kind of a little time capsule for you. Because again, by the time you're seeing this, the first episode has already aired. I probably already promoted it on my social media and hopefully you checked it out. But if you didn't, please consider checking out next week's episode. I think it's going to be good. We're going to be covering a lot of different cases. We're going to be talking about crimes in the headlines. We're going to have some great guests on every single week. In some situations, we'll break down the investigation. In others, we may debate a couple topics. If I had to guess, I think with Nancy and Mara, we're definitely going to be debating a little bit, which I think could be fun. And so if, if you want to support me and you're into those types of shows, please consider checking it out. All right, so the real reason we're here tonight, Officer Kevin Brame. As I've told you guys before, sometimes I try to find a connection to the victim because it makes me, I I feel like it makes me a better storyteller when I can relate to that person in some way. And and in in many instances, it's it's just a small connection. But regarding Kevin Brame, as I just said his title, I think you probably all figured out the connection here. As most of you already know, uh, I'm a former police officer. Kevin Brame at the time that he was murdered was a police officer, although he was not shot in the line of duty. And and I wouldn't necessarily cover this case just because he was a police officer. What what drew me to this investigation is the fact that there's definitely some twists and turns. And as you will see, a surprising person of interest in this case. So without kind of foreshadowing it anymore, let's just get right into it. Kevin Bartholomew Brame was born on February 21, 1968, in Ohio to his parents Rosemary and Jerry, a police detective. He grew up in Dayton, Ohio with his younger twin siblings, a brother named Kerry and a sister named Karen. During his childhood and throughout high school, Kevin was actively involved in sports and community activities. In high school, he played soccer, contributed to the yearbook, participated in the school band, and joined various organizations like the Junior Council of World Affairs and the Cougar Pep Squad. He also helped manage the girls' softball team and was a member of the varsity baseball and swim teams. Kevin graduated from high school in 1986 and then went on to serve in the Air Force Reserves. In the early 1990s, he began a relationship with a woman named Carla, 
and they eventually got married and had two sons. Kevin left the Air Force and then attended the police academy, graduating in 1993. After graduation, he joined the Dayton Police Department, where he stayed until his death six years later. His favorite detail was the bike patrol because it kept him physically active and it allowed him to engage more with the community. Kevin's dedication to his work as a police officer was evident. He received multiple commendations for arresting suspected car thieves in 1996 and 1998 and for contributing to the efforts to reduce drug activity and violence in early 1999. Kevin and Carla worked hard so that they could send their children to private school. They had opposite shifts, which ensured a parent, not a babysitter, was almost always with the boys. Kevin worked the night shift while Carla was employed during the day at an automotive company. When Kevin wasn't working, he cherished spending time with his sons. One of their neighbors told the Dayton Daily News that Kevin was always playing with his kids outside. They bonded over soccer and baseball, and he even coached some of their sports teams. Although Kevin's relationship with his sons was close as it could be, his marriage to Carla faced difficulties. According to the Dayton Daily News, the couple separated in the fall of 1990, and by mid-October, Kevin had moved out and began staying with his mother, Rosemary. She later said Kevin and Carla worked out the custody agreement for their two sons, who were now eight and five years old. The custody agreement was hard on Kevin because he wasn't able to see them as frequently, but he remained positive that things would get better. In late October, Kevin rented a house and began decorating it so his sons would feel more comfortable. By October 31st, all the rooms were ready, except for Kevin's. Despite not having his own room ready, his next plan was to put up a basketball hoop in the garage for himself and his sons. Unfortunately, he never had the chance to complete this project or even move into the house. On Monday, November 1st, 31-year-old Kevin had to go to court for a work-related matter. Afterward, he got a call from his estranged wife, Carla, who said that their sons wanted to see him. Even though it wasn't his scheduled time with the boys, Kevin happily picked them up. They went shopping for a few video games and had dinner at Rooster's. Then, at around 7 or 7.30 p.m., Kevin took his sons to his mother's house to celebrate his father's birthday. Rosemary later recalled that Kevin wanted to get the boys home by 8.30 p.m. because they had school the next morning. But since they wanted to celebrate Jerry's birthday, they ended up leaving a little after 8.30 p.m. Kevin drove to Carla's house at 624 Cherry Drive, parked in the driveway, and went inside to set up the kids' new video game. Carla tucked the boys into bed, and Kevin told her that he would call once he got back to his mother's house. He left just before 9 p.m., and it was drizzling outside as he walked to his car. At 8.58 p.m., several of Carla's neighbors called 911, reporting they heard a gunshot. Two minutes later, Carla called 911. She calmly told the dispatcher, quote, My husband is a Dayton cop, and quote, He just went outside and I thought I heard a gunshot. My neighbor just ran over here, and my husband is outside on the ground. The dispatcher assured her that help was on the way, and asked her to stay on the line. Carla started screaming, quote, oh my God, repeatedly, and asked if she could go outside to be with Kevin, but she was told to stay inside. Carla handed the phone to her neighbor, who told the dispatcher that the brain children were in bed. He explained that he didn't see the shooting, but heard the shot. He went outside and found Kevin lying face down near his car. Officers arrived and pronounced Kevin dead. Later, it was determined that he was shot in the neck with a shotgun from behind at a, quote, relatively close range. It was believed the shooter emerged from the nearby bushes and shot Kevin while he walked to his car. Kevin had his service gun with him, but he couldn't defend himself because he never saw the attack coming. Carla immediately called Rosemary, who arrived to find Kevin dead with yellow police tape surrounding the house. She later told WHIO-TV7 that she collapsed upon realizing Kevin was gone. The police interviewed Carla and her neighbors. They recalled hearing the gunshot, but no arguments or sounds of anyone fleeing. Unfortunately, no one got a clear look at the suspect. The police only heard vague descriptions, including dark colored cars and a quote shadowy figure that may have been the killer. The motive of Kevin's murder wasn't immediately known and the lack of clear suspect descriptions made the police investigation challenging. On the day after Kevin's murder, the Dayton police held a press conference where the commander of the Central Investigation Bureau said, quote, We've got quite a bit of work to do. It's a wide open investigation. Nobody is ruled out. 
we're looking at a lot of different theories. The Dayton police chief added, quote, We will not stop until we find the person or persons responsible for this horrific act. The police kept searching for a motive behind Kevin's murder. Initially, they considered robbery as a motive, but that was quickly ruled out. They also explored the possibility that his job might be related to the murder. NBC News reported that police checked cases Kevin had worked on, looking for anyone who might want revenge. If you recall, in early 1990, Kevin had been commended for contributing to reducing drug activity and violence in Dayton, so it was possible he made some enemies along the way. And while Kevin was overall a great cop, he did get reprimanded three times for reasons unknown. Then, in 1999, he received a 45-day suspension for pulling over one of his wife's co-workers for personal reasons. Now, I want to weigh in on this real quick, and, and by no means am I trying to talk down about Kevin, but this particular part of the story does kind of date this case, because if something like this happened today with everything we have going on in the world, having a police officer abuse their power in this way, um, more than likely with the public scrutiny that we have now, uh, Kevin would have lost his job. So not saying that it's okay what he did, not saying that it makes him a bad person, but it does show you how times have changed since this whole incident took place. Because of all this information, detectives investigating Kevin's murder had quite a few leads to follow. But in the end, they determined that his murder was not work-related. Detectives didn't reveal this to the public for quite some time, but they came to believe that Kevin's murder was a planned attack. They theorized that the killer was someone who knew Kevin's schedule for that evening. Now, this whole part of the story is, is really interesting to me for a couple reasons. First off, Without having access to the to the actual investigation, it's just a guess on my part, but I really find myself wondering how investigators were able to rule out the fact that this could have been work-related. Could it have been during a routine traffic stop? Could it have been just in passing while talking to someone that wasn't ultimately documented by Kevin? Or could he have done something in the course of his duty that he shouldn't have been done? And, and that's not to condemn Kevin or paint him in a bad light, but we know from his history that he has made some bad decisions. And could he have done that with someone else? And maybe they were really upset about it. Again, I don't know how they came to this conclusion. All I can do is take them at their word at this point. But that brings us to the second part of this whole thing that's really interesting, which is the fact that now they believe it was an orchestrated or a planned attack. And I find myself again asking, without having access to the records, how did they come to this conclusion? Is it just a theory, or do they have something more concrete that they're not sharing with us? On November 6th, Kevin's funeral was held. Officers from all over Ohio, including Cleveland and Cincinnati, attended. WTN-TV reported that officers wanted people to remember Kevin's life and his commitment to serve and protect, and not his brutal murder. Three days later, the Dayton Fraternal Order of Police offered a $5,000 reward for any information regarding Kevin's investigation. On November 16th, the Dayton Police Department held a ceremony to recognize and honor the drug team Kevin had been a part of prior to his murder. His sister Karen accepted Kevin's award on his behalf. In a short speech at the ceremony, Karen said, quote, As you can imagine, it's a bittersweet moment, for we are glad that Kevin found a career which he took pride in and that you have recognized his work in such a wonderful way. But really, Kevin should be here to accept this award with his two sons, watching him share the moment. Just under two months later, on January 3rd, 2000, Carla sued the Dayton police chief and the Dayton postmaster. She said they had interfered with her getting Kevin's $240,000 life insurance policies, which would be around $436,000 today. Carla said without the money, she might lose the house and the boys might have to leave their private school. In the lawsuit, Carla claimed that she wasn't a suspect and had cooperated with the investigation, even passing a lie detector test that was conducted by a polygrapher she and her attorneys had hired. Carla said that despite the fact that she wasn't a suspect, police didn't send Kevin's toxicology or autopsy reports to the insurance company, which kept her from getting the money. She further claimed that the postmaster was, quote, pulling and logging her mail at the request of the police. Now, this is a really important piece of information here because I don't know how she would have known this. Maybe she had someone on the inside. Maybe someone had slipped something to her. But if it's true that the postmaster was logging all her incoming and outgoing mail, 
and this was at the request of the police, this does give you a little bit of insight into their investigation. And at minimum, it says that at one point, I don't know how far it went or if it's still believed, but at one point, she was a person of interest. Now, she's claimed that she was never a suspect, and it doesn't appear that police ever publicly named her as a suspect. But I will tell you this. Even though she wasn't publicly named as a suspect or a person of interest, that doesn't mean that behind closed doors in that police station, she wasn't considered one. Now, in the lawsuit, Carla said she wanted the police to send the reports to her lawyer and to stop messing with her mail. She also asked for a temporary restraining order against the police and the postmaster. On January 12th, a hearing regarding Carla's lawsuit was held. Her lawyer sought to subpoena and depose two police officers for information about Kevin's murder, but the judge denied this request and all others. Three days later, Carla filed another lawsuit, this time against the insurance companies she claimed owed her money. She argued that since she wasn't a suspect, they were obligated to release the funds to her. According to the Dayton Daily News, Carla eventually reached a settlement with the insurance companies. She then relocated to Texas with her sons and cut ties with Kevin's family. After these legal proceedings, Carla's relationship with the police was non-existent and they later described her as uncooperative. By the one year anniversary of Kevin's murder, his case remained unsolved. In order to raise awareness of this fact and ensure that people knew that his case had not been resolved, a vigil was held in downtown Dayton with around 150 people in attendance. These vigils continued every year. At the two-year anniversary vigil, the police stated that they were still investigating but needed tips from the public to solve the case. They promised to continue their efforts until they identified Kevin's killer. By February of 2002, a billboard about Kevin's murder was put up in Dayton and a banner version of the billboard was placed on the police department's building where it remains to this day. Additionally, 5,000 bumper stickers offering a $25,000 reward were created passed out, and put on police cars. Kevin's mother, Rosemary, told WHIO-TV7 that seeing these bumper stickers around Dayton gave her hope that someone would spot them and call the cold case detective. In October, several of Kevin's friends and family members spoke at the Dayton City Commissioner's meeting. They implored the commissioners to do more to solve Kevin's murder. Kevin's father specifically requested an increase in size of the homicide team and more training for officers to handle homicide cases. After the meeting, the Dayton police chief met with the Brames and told them that solving Kevin's murder was still a top priority. In November, police revealed that they had suspects that they had not yet eliminated and they were waiting for enough evidence to bring the case to trial. In December, the Dayton police department held a press conference and announced that they were hoping to increase the reward in Kevin's case to $100,000. They asked for donations to raise the money, stating, quote, We felt that $25,000 wasn't enough incentive to get somebody to come forward with information. Rosemary said at the press conference, quote, It's a case that everyone should be interested in. If a police officer is not safe in our city, then no one is. In June of 2003, two new detectives started working full-time on Kevin's case. They planned to review the entire case and search for any mistakes. Only two months later, the police raided the home of a man named C.D. McCoy, who had worked with Carla Brame at the automotive company in 1999. The Dayton Daily News reported the police took several documents and a box of shoes from C.D.'s house. He was also brought in for questioning. It's unclear exactly what he said in the interview. However, he later told the Dayton Daily News, quote, They took me into the interrogation room and started asking me a whole lot of questions. They're telling me I'm lying and talking about I killed him for $2,000 and that they had witnesses, people saying I was bragging and boasting about it. Now, it's important to note CD has said he was not involved in Kevin's murder. Now, police declined to call CD a suspect. They said, quote, We obviously have accounts from witnesses that don't coincide with his response. The facts of the case led us to his house. We have others we have to go to now, but he was the one who jumped out the biggest. Ultimately, C.D. was never charged in connection with the case, and he passed away in 2012. So there's a lot to talk about here. I'll talk about it now, but I'll probably also talk about it again in my perspective. So the blocks are starting to build here, right? We know that although they haven't came out and said anything publicly, the police were very apprehensive about assisting Carla in obtaining 
Kevin's insurance money. And I don't think that was unintentional. I think that they didn't have enough to call her a suspect, but there was something that they had internally, who knows what that was, where they felt like money could have been a motive here and they were very reluctant to give any information that would contribute to her obtaining that money. Add on to that years later, now you're looking at a situation where Carla's co-worker, uh, his house is being searched and he's being interrogated. There is a potential here based on what he said publicly that they really didn't have much and that they were, frankly, they were lying during the interrogation saying they had other witnesses and throwing out amounts of money, maybe hoping that he would think, oh man, they got me and, and start spouting off at the mouth and maybe give them something that they could build off of. Clearly that didn't happen. Clearly he wasn't charged. And it's very evident that after that interrogation, although they tried some different tactics, they didn't have enough. And they definitely didn't have enough to call him a suspect publicly, which is why, which is why they didn't. Now, in November of 2003, the Associated Press ran an article marking the fourth anniversary of Kevin's murder. Rosemary told them, quote, to this day, I don't know who did it, but I don't think it was work related. Police went through Kevin's files and couldn't find any case serious enough where someone would have retaliated like this. No, I think this was a planned killing. That same month, the police announced that the special team investigating Kevin's murder had expanded to four members. They focused on the weeks leading up to his murder and they were able to create a detailed timeline of his activities during that period. In December of 2005, the police informed the media that while they still had no suspects, they did have a quote, good idea of how this all occurred. They said it was likely that all the events leading to Kevin's death were planned and that the person who killed Kevin knew he'd be dropping the children off at Carla's that evening. By June of 2006, the Montgomery County Cold Case Squad had joined the team working on Kevin's murder. According to WTN-TV, the squad believed that at least two people were involved. They also developed a motive, although they didn't disclose it publicly. Detectives also noted that someone in Dayton likely had information and that they were waiting for circumstances to change, making it more likely for someone to come forward. They emphasized the fact that they didn't believe the murder was related to Kevin's job or any of the arrests he made. While the case continued to go cold, Kevin's family made efforts to keep his name in the media. In 2009, they were able to get Kevin's case featured on a set of playing cards dedicated to unsolved cases. That same year, the police noted that, thanks to the Brames' persistent efforts, they continued to receive tips about the murder, but they still didn't have any suspects. In November of 2010, Kevin's family launched the website justiceforkevinbrame.com, which aimed to gather tips, raise awareness, and provide a platform for people to share information about the case. The family continued fighting for answers and coverage. Then in 2014, Kevin's father Jerry tragically passed away after 15 years of tirelessly seeking answers about his son's unsolved murder. In 2015, they ran an obituary for Kevin in the Dayton Daily News, emphasizing the $100,000 reward and encouraging people in the community with information to come forward. The obituary ended with a heartfelt quote, the lives of our family were forever changed that awful night. Kevin was very much loved. We love him still and we miss him terribly. We continue to pray that hearts will be changed and we remain hopeful that justice for Kevin will come. Two years later, Rosemary spoke with Dateline stating, I miss everything about my son, his laughter, his smile. His brother and sister have lost a quintessential brother and he was loved by his loyal friends who still come by and visit me. Rosemary expressed her belief that the people in Dayton know what happened to Kevin, yet they refused to come forward. In 2019, Rosemary revealed to WHIO TV7 that before Kevin was murdered, he told people he was being stalked. In the same article, the police said they still believed Kevin's murder had been planned. A detective explained, quote, in any case like this, it leads close to home. And by that, I mean friends, acquaintances, a large group of people. Unfortunately, the last update in Kevin's case is from October of 2021. At the time, the Dayton Police Department restructured its cold case unit to improve its success in solving cases. Three full-time detectives were leading the unit, and one of the cases they were working on was Officer Kevin Brames. Today, Rosemary and her children continue their fight for answers 
and to keep Kevin's case in the public eye. And they've made one thing very clear. They will not give up until his murder is solved. All right, so let's get into my perspective on Kevin Brames' case. We went through a lot here. And I know, let's start with the obvious. It's clear that law enforcement and the investigators working this case think there's a connection between Carla and Kevin's murder. They haven't said it publicly, but based on their actions, I don't think that's a that's a leap. And based on what we know on the outside, I can't really say for sure that I agree with them because there hasn't been much released. So it would be irresponsible and unprofessional for me to say, yeah, you know what? He was killed in Carla's driveway. It had to be Carla. I, I don't know enough. I'm just telling you that based on their actions and my former experience, that's definitely what they think. But what I do like here is that on multiple occasions, they've brought in new people. They've restructured the cold case unit. And as we've seen on other cases, I emphasize it all the time. The best thing you can do with these older cold cases is bring in new people with new perspectives. They're not necessarily better than the investigators before them, but because they're coming in there with no biases and no preconceived notions, they're going to open up that investigation like it's the first time they've ever seen it, because it is. They're going to start from the beginning, and as I even said in this story, they're, they're going through deliberately looking for mistakes because that mistake could be the detour where this case went off the rails. And that's really important if you want to get different results than what you've had in the past, because clearly there has been a lot of effort put into this case, a lot of money as well, and they don't have an arrest yet. So whatever they've done so far, regardless of how much effort has been put into it, it hasn't worked. So they need to try a new approach. And so let's put aside for a second the theory that Carla um, planned out or hired someone to kill Kevin for insurance money. Yes, It's a possible motive. It's just as likely as any other scenario, in my opinion, from the outside looking in. And that's why I want to go back to what I said earlier regarding Kevin's past. I'm going to give you a quick story about myself, and I don't like to always make it relate back to my job because I feel like I'm always telling a war story. But for those of you who don't know, when I was in narcotics, um, we, we did a lot of search warrants and some were low level, some were high level. And I can tell you that one day while responding to the police station, I was brought into the chief's office and I was informed that there was a hit put out on me where they were going to kill me. And the reasoning behind it was essentially this young guy who I knew of was kind of overseeing this smaller operation of narcotics in the city. And my team was doing a lot of damage. We were taking a lot of them out. And frankly, he just didn't like me, and he he tried to um, conduct or or orchestrate this hit on me from prison. And luckily, one of my informants were there and and dimed him out, and we were able to cut it off before anything happened. But the reason I bring this up is officers are looking at the cases that Kevin dealt with, and maybe none of the individuals in those reports are responsible for this. However, there could be someone on the outside who is connected to one of these individuals but isn't necessarily named in the report who has an axe to grind with Kevin and may just be pissed at the way he handled something and Kevin, for all we know, never even met this person. So for me, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that in some way his murder could still be connected to his job. Like I said, maybe not a direct connection but something where through someone that he dealt with in a negative way Um, or had a negative experience with or impacted someone's life in a not-so-positive way, there's someone else who took that personal and decided to retaliate on, on this person's behalf. As far as where we go from here, what do I really say? The Dayton Police Department has spared no expense, has devoted many resources, more than we see on a lot of cold cases, to try to help figure out what happened here. And it seems like they're going to continue to do that. I mean, like I said, they still have the banner on their building. So they're committed to this one and they're in it until they get closure. The unfortunate thing that I have to mention here, and I think Rosemary has said it multiple times, it seems at this point, unless someone out there comes forward, this case might not be solved. I don't think there's anything else that law enforcement can do 
I don't know if there's any other stone that can be turned over. Whatever information they have, whatever leads they have all, already, I feel like they've been vetted. Now, as I said earlier, there could be a mistake and they could always go back and, and recalibrate and relook at that. But if they did everything that they could and it's all on the up and up, they need new information to follow up on. And that's where you guys come in. So if you have any information about Kevin Brame's murder, you can call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-637-5735. And just remember, there is a $100,000 reward available. As always, guys, I want to thank you for making it to the end of the episode. If you're watching on YouTube, please leave a comment down below. And if you're listening on audio, you can leave a review as well. And finally, I want to say that I'm thinking of Rosemary and the rest of Kevin's family. Uh, as a parent, I can't imagine going through something like this, but I can tell by Rosemary's fight and determination that as long as she's here, she will continue to do what she's doing until hopefully she gets justice for her son. And I, if she happens to hear or see this, I just want her to know that myself and everyone out there uh, who's listening or watching, we are now with you on this fight and we will be here to support you. Uh, that's going to do it for me, guys. Everyone stay safe out there. I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.